This is chapter 23, Gynecologic Emergencies. So one of the things that we have to do or could potentially be called to do is to deliver a baby or deal with very sensitive subjects with women. Women are uniquely designed to conceive and give birth, um, which is good, yes, but also can create a lot of different problems specific to the female genitalia. So you have both internal and external structures. For external genitalia, you can see it up on your screen. Um, the vaginal opening is just posterior to the urethral opening. So there's two different orifices, just in case you didn't know. There's two major folds of tissue that surround both the urethral and vaginal opening. It's the labia minora and the labia majora, which you can see up there on the screen. The clitoris is anterior um, to the labia. It's the very anterior end of it. And then at the very posterior aspect, you have the anus. In between the vaginal opening and the anus, you have the perineum. Internal, you've got um, your ovaries, which are the primary female reproductive excuse me, organ. They lie on each side of the lower abdomen. They produce actual eggs called the ovum, and then a fetus is going to develop from a fertilized ovum. Fallopian tubes are what allow the egg to get into the uterus, so they're on each side. The uterus is very muscular. Um, this is where the fetus is going to produce and grow during pregnancy. Um, the narrowest part of the uterus is the cervix, which opens into the vagina. There's really nothing that stops the external genitalia from being contiguous with the um, internal abdomen. It's kind of got one straight connective tube, and I'll show you a picture here in a minute so you can see what I'm saying. Um, the vagina is the outermost cavity of the woman's reproductive system, though still considered internal. So as you can see on your screen, you've got the vagina, which actually opens to the external environment. You've got the cervix there, which has a hole in the center of it called the cervical os, OS, and that is also contiguous with the outside. You've got the uterus, kind of looks like an upside down pear, very, very thick and muscular. And then on either side, you have those squiggly little tubes. Those are the fallopian tubes. As you can see at the end of that, the ovary, which is that white thing, is not actually truly attached to the fallopian tube. Um, you've got kind of those little finger-like things there that actually beat in rhythm to try and pull the egg in, but they're not actually connected. So when something goes wrong with anything in the vagina, the um, uterus, fallopian tube, etc., it has a straight path out into the abdomen, and that's why it's so interesting and unique compared to male. Some things or processes that you need to know to understand. Uh, when a female reaches puberty, she begins to ovulate, which means the releasing of an egg. If that egg is not fertilized, then she experiences menstruation. The onset of menstruation is called menarche. And it occurs somewhere on average between 11 and 16 years. It can occur as early as eight or nine. Um, it seems like girls are having the onset of menstruation earlier and earlier, but typically somewhere between that 11 and 16 years of age. Any female who reaches menarche is capable of becoming pregnant. And even before that, uh, because you ovulate before you actually have a period, um, so before that first onset, if the female has ovulated, she can get pregnant. So when we're assessing somebody, anybody between the ages of 9 and 99 could potentially be pregnant. Um, obviously, there's the onset of menopause there somewhere, but um, 
generally occurs around age 50. Some women still have the ability to get pregnant until significantly after that. Um, so one question whenever we have abdominal pain is, could you be pregnant? And if they say no, ask them to elaborate on that. So how do you know that you're not pregnant? Just to give us some more information. But ovulation and menstruation will continue until menopause. Around age 50 is when onset happens, but it does take a couple of years. And some women just go into it very late. So each month, I, we already talked about ovulation. The ovum or the egg is released into the fallopian tubes. Um, if a woman has um, sex when that is in the fallopian tube and there's a sperm that actually fertilizes it, it'll fertilize within the fallopian tube and then it will pass all the way into the uterus where if it is viable, it will implant and then actually grow into a fetus. If fertilization doesn't occur within about 14 days of ovulation, that lining of the uterus begins to separate and then you have menstruation, which occurs for about a week, give or take. Um, so some causes of gynecologic emergencies, um, it kind of varies. It can be anything from STDs all the way to trauma. Um, any sort of abdominal pain or pelvic pain, it's kind of hard to narrow it down because everything is so close together. It could be gynecologic in uh, nature. It could be gastrointestinal in nature. So you just, you have to get really good at asking the right questions in order to narrow it down to figure out what exactly is going on. Some different things that could be going on. Pelvic inflammatory disease, or PID, is an infection of the upper organs of reproduction, so the uterus, the ovaries, fallopian tubes, um, occurs most exclusively in sexually active women. So this causes organis organisms to enter the vagina and then migrate up into the uterine cavity. Um, if it expands all the way to the fallopian tubes, it ends up causing scarring, which could um, result in either an ectopic pregnancy or even sterility. So the inability to have children. Um, an ectopic pregnancy is just a pregnancy that starts to develop outside of the uterus itself. Most commonly, it's going to be in the fallopian tube. But if that fertilized egg can't actually make its way down to the uterus, it can implant anywhere from uh, the abdominal cavity, it can implant in the fallopian tube, and then that can actually be life-threatening. If the infection spreads to the ovaries, it can lead to um, an abscess or a contained sac that has pus and a lot of bacteria and stuff in it, um, but that can actually be life-threatening, especially if that ruptures you basically spill all of those contents into the abdomen. So definitely not good. Um, the most common sign of pelvic inflammatory disease is actually just generalized lower abdominal pain. So it doesn't really lead you to PID uh, by any means. Other signs include abnormal or felt smelling vaginal discharge, increased pain with intercourse, Fever, general malaise, and then nausea and vomiting also are pretty common. Sexually transmitted diseases um, can lead to more serious conditions such as PID, but in and of themselves, they all have varying um, signs and symptoms and what causes them. Chlamydia is the most common STD in the United States. It's caused by a bacteria. Um, most patients have mild or absent system, symptoms. It's kind of uncommon for them to call 911 for uh, a chlamydia infection. Some women, if they have symptoms, are going to report lower abdominal pain, low back pain, 
nausea, fever, pain during sexual intercourse, or bleeding between periods. Um, you can have the infection that spreads up into the cervix, can spread to the rectum, and then of course can progress to PID. So something you wanna catch early and take care of because it's really easy to treat. Bacterial vaginosis is the most common vaginal in, uh, infection in women 15 to 44 years of age. Uh, normal bacteria itself are in the vagina. So they're just, there's bacteria there all the time. This is what happens when that becomes overgrown um, and kind of gets out of control um, and it has to be taken care of. Symptoms include itching, burning, pain, and then like a foul smelling discharge, kind of fishy in nature. Untreated, it can lead to premature birth, low birth weight if the woman is pregnant. Uh, it can also make the patient more susceptible to other serious infections and can cause uh, pelvic inflammatory. Gonorrhea is caused by a bacteria that grow and multiply very rapidly in warm, moist areas, which is definitely how the environment of the reproductive tract is. So the cervix, uterus, fallopian tube, and then the urethra in both men and women are very good growth areas for gonorrhea. The bacteria can also grow in the mouth, throat, eyes, and anus. The symptoms are more severe in men than they are in women. For women, uh, they may present with painful urination, burning or itching, yellowish or bloody vaginal discharge, and blood associated with sexual intercourse. And then if a severe infection is present, it typically presents with cramping and abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and bleeding between periods. It does have the potential to progress to pelvic inflammatory disease. So that's typically where you're gonna see more of those severe symptoms. Untreated, it can enter the bloodstream and spread to other parts of the body, including the brain. So this is definitely more in, a more serious infection that needs to get taken care of. Vaginal bleeding is actually a very common reason that we are called. Um, sometimes bleeding can be seen as menstruation and be overlooked, but when somebody starts to bleed outside of their normal menstrual cycle, especially if they're very regular, um, they tend to panic a little bit. So possible causes include abnormal menstruations or just an abnormal cycle. Vaginal trauma, ectopic pregnancy, spontaneous abortions, cervical polyps, and then, of course, cancer. Patient assessment is going to start out the same way as anything else. So your scene size up. Um, gynecological emergencies can involve large amounts of blood, so make sure that you have the appropriate PPE on. Um, Involve police if you suspect an assault, and your mechanism of injury may be easily understood from dispatch information. Otherwise, it's really necessary for you to get an accurate and detailed assessment and to ask the right questions. It's really hard to get a really good primary impression in the field, but what we do have the ability to do is determine how sick or not sick the patient is. And that will help you determine whether you need to take life-saving measures, whether you need to call additional EMS resources in. Um, anyone who neglects to consider a gynecologic problem in a woman of childbearing age um, can misdiagnose about 50% of the time. So, Lots of really good questions. You're not going to get a whole lot probably from the scene, but keeping an open mind, asking good questions is definitely going to be what's going to help you out. We'll continue in the next one.